Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Parks. And today we're joined by a special guest, uh, joining us from San Francisco by way of Florence. Coral Sisk is an Italian-American blogger and sommelier doing food tours in Florence. She's also the founder of Curious Appetite Travel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Tiffany, you're going to introduce, I mean, we've been wanting to have Coral on for a long time anyway, but the reason we invited her was in reaction to a particular article. And so Tiffany, maybe to kick us off, why don't you lay out the premise yeah. here? Well, it popped up on my Instagram, actually, an article from Eater, which, correct me if I'm wrong, Coral, it's a online food magazine. Is that correct? Yes. And I was intrigued by the title of this article, which is, I am tired of watching people go to Italy. And whatever you think about this article, that is clickbait right there. Mm -hmm. Because either you're one of the people who has been in Italy recently, and you're kind of feeling offensive, offended by this title, or you're one of those people who actually is tired of seeing all of their friends go to Italy. Either way, I'm sure this got a, a lot of clicks and a lot of attention. I'm not going to read the article, which is by Bettina Makalintal. It's an article, basically, I mean, you can go to our show notes if you want to read the full article, I will link to it. But it's kind of a little bit of a... Uh, a complaint, if you will, about how there are so many food shows on TV right now that are all about Italy and particularly Italian cuisine and that are focusing so much on travel to Italy, eating in Italy. And then, of course, the larger backdrop of everybody you know is going to Italy this summer or this past year has been going to Italy. So I read through the uh, the brief version of the article, which was on Instagram. And then, of course, I saw Coral's comments because I follow Coral. So they popped up first. And what followed was a very lively debate. And I couldn't believe how many people had such strong opinions on this topic on both sides. Mm -hmm. And as I read these comments, it was strange because I felt like every single comment I read, no matter what their opinion was, I found myself thinking, that got a point. Or I can totally get that. I can get that. Like, that makes sense. So I so I really did see both sides of this issue. And so I mentioned it to Kate. I thought, doesn't this sound like a great topic? And she said, yeah, but we got to bring Co- Coral on to talk about it with us. Yeah. So Coral, what was your position when it comes to the debate about, you know, whether or not you're sick of watching people on television and in your real life go to Italy? Well, um, I think my reaction to that is because I also dabble in food writing, that this is a, a, a very common uh, discussion and topic in the food writing world, that Italian food is like always focused on and it's always highlighted and other cultures are ignored. So I am in a strange position because I live in Italy. I work in Italian culinary tourism. Obviously, I benefit from this, but at the same time, I see the other side very clearly and it's very true that other cultures and other cuisines get wildly ignored in the face of Italian food and like you Tiffany I also see the points and of course I love Italian cuisine I've dedicated my life to it but I also see the other side and that there's conversations that I get into with you know food people or, or tra- you know travel professionals or other writers that Italy just knows how to market itself really well You know, there are other cultures and other countries that have the same things that Italy offers. They just aren't as marketable or they haven't figured out how to market themselves as well. And that's what I kind of got into some of the comments. And then, of course, you know, the responses were very, very amusing to see how how people were willing to, like, die on their hill to defend Italy. And I was this this monster that was how dare I. Uh, It was just so funny because I'm so invested in Italy. Does that answer your question about like where I stand on the matter? Yeah, but so when you say that Italy is really good at marketing itself, I mean, I got from the article that it's sort of almost as if these television shows like Stanley Tucci wants to go to Italy and we all watch it. It's almost like he is marketing it. He is marketing it. So what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's true that, yeah, these shows are marketing Italy, but also Italy... I should uh, explain that better. So in the realm of Italian cuisine and wine and all that, because I'm also sommelier, you know, and I work in Tuscany, 
Tuscan wines, like let's go from a smaller level. Tuscany is known all over the world for its wines. There are other regions that have amazing, incredible wines. They don't have the marketing drink that Tuscany has. They don't have the same amount of money. So it's kind of like what, come, what came first, the chicken or the egg? These shows go to Italy, they go to Tuscany, and it further propagates a snowball effect, you know, where Tuscany gets bigger and bigger. But they also have the infrastructure to market themselves well. So I think that true that these shows are going there and they are marketing them. But I think that Italy has, or Italian, you know, tourism boards or food and wine have figured out a way to position themselves in the market very well. And, and it's just like a, a symbiotic relationship between the media and between Italy's marketing efforts. Tucci has this Italian background. I'm Italian American myself, so I can identify with some of that nostalgia. You know, so a lot of times these stories are sold on people's returning to their roots and returning to their heritage. These are compelling stories that a lot of people can relate with in the United States. Yeah, that makes sense. There are so many Italian Americans in the United States and in the English speaking world. There's so many uh, descendants of Italian immigrants that it's it's easy to be like, yes, I'm Italian because my great grandmother was Italian. I used to say that I'm Italian because my great grandmother. Therefore, I really understand Italian food and I appreciate it so much more. Yeah, that's fascinating. I've never that Italy would be good at marketing is also a surprise to me. Like it makes sense. But I think I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think, you know, when you said what came first, I feel like it got marketed and then you know, by, by a third party, by an external, you know, whether it was the United States or something. And then Italy sort of cashed in on it after the fact, because I've always felt like Italy is not necessarily naturally that savvy about that kind of stuff in other realms. Like, I don't know, that's just my, that's just how I see it. And working in Italy, I've always felt like they're not as savvy with, you know, the products online and digital media and, and stuff like this. I feel like the one common denominator when it comes to shows about Italy is that it always has a feeling of being super relaxing and beautiful. Mm -hmm. Everybody's so relaxed. There's nothing frenetic that's happening when you're in Italy. And it also is kind of played as very wholesome. Like this is back to the earth. This is how humanity used to do things. This is the right way to do it. The way we crush our grapes, the way we harvest our olives, you know, it's all depicted in these very, they find like the the homesteading families who have been doing this for generations. They don't go to the giant factories, you know, they do these little family artisans. And so it has both this relaxing and this very warm feel of exactly kind of what you're saying, not just nostalgia for heritage, but nostalgia for when things were of a simpler time. And in that way, if indeed that is marketing, that's pretty smart because, you know, it's like we're looking for the calm and the storm and you don't see a lot of let's travel to, I don't know, India that's just like, I'm sitting relaxing on this beautiful, you know, it's often much more wild and, uh, yeah, and lively, wild and colorful and busy. What do you think? Well, it's, it's really interesting to hear your feedback and your uh, perceptions, especially regarding, you know, the marketing aspect. As a blogger, too, I'm, uh, I attend or I'm invited to, you know, different press events or trips and things like that, in which there's all these organizations involved with funding and trying to bring awareness to a certain product or a certain region. And I do feel that, strangely enough, Italy is really organized in this regard, especially in, in food and wine. There's a lot of money in wine. Clearly, so much of it is exported, so it's in their best interest for that to be organized well. In fact, I almost am critical towards the U.S. in certain ways and how they could improve their marketing efforts and their PR campaigns around the wine regions and different food regions that Italy, has, I feel like, has dialed in quite well. And as I'm saying this, I'm thinking of Spain, because Spain is a country that is immensely interesting from a culinary wine point of view. And you don't see half as much of the type of marketing or the type of allure or fa fantasism that you do online that, that you do with, with Italy. And I wonder sometimes if the, and I'm, I'm not in Spain, so I, it could be a very ignorant comment or uh, observation, but I wonder if they have the same, the same organization that Italy does around like organizing press events or promoting their products or their wine regions or or specialties. So then, then what you said too about India not having the leisure effect, right? Of tra that's what people want, you know. Especially those last two years have been extremely stressful. People want to escape, and Italians are really good 
at being hospitable. But there are really great leisure sectors of the, you know, of Indian tourism or of other countries that, again, that don't get highlighted because we have this, and this is, again, ties back to the article, that we have this idea about certain cultures and certain countries and what their strong points are, which is dangerously limiting, you know, pigeonholing certain countries on, on certain selling points, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. Okay. So a lot of people who commented on this article and who were really offended by it were saying, well, I love Italy. You know, I've been to Italy 40 times and I always discover something new. I always go deeper. I, and I've been around the world, but there's no place like Italy. I think they have a point. I do believe that as far as the media is concerned, yeah, the media needs to do better. But as far as on a personal level, person by person, you can't really fault somebody for wanting to go back to Italy again and again, if that's what they love. Um, yeah. Yeah. There might be awesome, amazing other places around the world, but Italy does do, like you were saying, hospitality and food and wine and art as well, so well. It would take 10 lifetimes to see all that Italy has to offer. So is it really that we've pigeonholed Italy as, you know, the best place and everywhere else is second best? Or is that Italy actually the best place? <laughs> and this is my question. <laughs> I mean, I think that part of the the point in the article is that, I mean, it's critical of these TV executives for greenlighting one Italian show after the other after the other, but kind of a point in the article and a point in the comments that I read underneath are like, well, if that shows successful over and over and over again, it shows that a bigger portion of people are interested in Italy or love Italy and they don't feel the same way about other places. And so, yeah, if Stanley Tucci makes another series, you know, it's going to be a bigger success than perhaps if he went somewhere else. So I love that you asked this question because again, I feel like the devil is advocate in this whole situation because I dedicated my academic career to Italian studies, which means like instead of studying science, which would have been a lot more lucrative and made more, made more sense to my family, I decided to study Italian. So I am in love with Italy and, you know, Italian culture and history. So I say this with that in the, the background. It is true that every single region is diverse. They have their own cuisine. It's like going to 20 different countries. It is true. I feel the same way within Tuscany. I can spend years not leaving Tuscany because there is so much to be discovered within just one region. But that being said, I still think that I have two points. One point is that these shows go to the same places over and over again, which is what the article says too. She's like, I'm tired of seeing the same perfectly blistered Neapolitan pizza. They are doing a disservice by not showcasing other regions. So I was listening to one of your episodes where you're talking about like the quality of life and you know, where should one move to? And you were talking about these Northern Italian regions that doesn't get a lot of attention. Not a lot of people know about Trieste. They haven't been to Treviso. I think you said Treviso, no, you said- um, you Bolzano, were, you said Bolzano. there we go. Yeah, or even Valdosta. You know, there's these amazing regions that don't even get any attention. They cling on to Instagram celebrities to help be their fixer for these shows. And they go to the same regions over and over again. I, I understand people's defensiveness because it is like, you know, hey, you're attacking like this love that I have, but they're missing the bigger picture. And I think that this, this writer was genius by trying to point out, and I don't even think she meant to. I think it was a flippant thing that she, she wrote. But the first thing is to promote diversity. If, we, if you're gonna focus on the same country and over and over again, go to different places and then, um, maybe, yeah, of course, consider other countries. I don't think she meant at all to say, you know, consider other regions of Italy. But I wonder if her, her sentiment would be different if it actually highlighted what Italy is supposedly so diverse for. That's interesting, because that was one of the early critiques that those early travel influencers, Rick Steves, like the big shots that came out in the 70s, you know, they got a lot of criticism for popularizing places that were not popular prior places like the Amalfi Coast that now every single show in Italy goes to, you know, it got overrun by them. They have to to live with the fact that they started it. They brought it into the consciousness. And then now, like you say, everybody goes to the same places. You're right. Like we should go to other places, but there is also, there's a danger in that for those other places. People 
people always say that, like, oh, well, that place is going to get ruined. And it's not. There's plenty of Italy to go around. I don't think that if every single region was properly highlighted that it would ruin the... The, the whole country is already overrun by mass tourism. It's already too late. So we might as well show some love to other regions. It's like kind of my fan. No, and it would be... It would be better because it would also spread people around. Yeah. I mean, I do tours in Italy and whenever I always ask people, so where are you going on your trip? And they always say Florence, Venice. If it's summertime, it's Florence and the Amalfi Coast and maybe mm -hmm. Tuscany. And if it's wintertime, it's Florence and Venice. It's always those places. You you don't even hear people like saying, oh, Bologna or Sicily, places that are I would say like second tier, not low on the list. If there was more marketing towards some of these other parts of Italy, not just marketing that they do themselves, but attention from the media, maybe it would spread the tourists around and places like mm -hmm. Florence that are such tiny. I mean, Florence is such a tiny city considering how many people go there. And I've had tourists tell me, oh my gosh, Florence was so crowded compared to here. And I said, it's not that Florence, it's, just more, it's not that more people go there. It's just that you have to fit the same amount of people in a much smaller city that would be better. One other thing I wanted to mention, which is another point that's made, I wonder if the, the writer was trying to make, which has also been made in uh, the series Ugly Delicious. Did you guys ever see that when uh, David Chang, he's a chef in New York. I highly recommend watching that series, but he, he did an episode on pasta. He was basically like pitting off Asian pasta and Italian pasta, you know, like there's so much diversity in Asian pasta. You know, why is like Italy get all the attention? And they make a point that it's more approachable because it's Caucasian. A lot of people feel comfortable in a place that's approachable. Not that they understand Italian, but there's just like little things that they wouldn't feel as comfortable if they were going to an Asian country or if they were, you know, going to a another country that, that wasn't Western, you know? And this is something that maybe is an uncomfortable topic for a lot of people, but it's something that they should question, you know? China, for example, and again, you know, this is a difficult comparison because the governments are wildly different, but China is humongous. Italy's small, and this is what makes Italy so interesting because it's so small and yet it's so diverse. China is extremely vast and has so much differences in landscapes. And I haven't been, but, you know, I'm currently very curious and I would love to go explore its culinary rep repertoire. But this is one of the, the, the criticisms that we hear in the food world about Italian food, that why people cling on to it so much, is that it's a safe place for a certain type of people. So I think there's a combination of things going on. I have a question that's separate. I did not read all of the comments that were the, below this article. But Coral, I know at some point after you made your different points, there was some guy who was saying, pointing out what you do for a living. Well, you do food tours in Florence. You make your living uh, on this very stuff, right? And it's such a kind of typical comment to make. But I was interested in getting your take. And, you know, maybe Tiffany and I, too, with making this podcast is like, what he's basically saying is, what is your role in this? If people are really tired of um, having Italy shoved in their faces, what is your role in this and, professionally? And, and criticizing. That's so funny. It's like the typical, like, don't bite the hand that feeds you attitude. Um, you know, people are, are full of contradictions. You don't have to have one singular idea or opinion, you know, consistency is the road to the unimaginative is like what I think, you know, so not all of us have consistent, you know, ideas or opinions, and we're constantly contradicting ourselves, which, which is, I, I think is good for some progress in society, but still, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly invested, you know, in my Italian path, you know, like I said, I spent my undergraduate degree on my on Italian studies and I've spent the last 10 years I'm very confident in how I feel about Italy that I can still criticize where it needs to be and so the reason why I contributed you know my opinion is that I'm saying hey I'm the person that should be criticizing this article but I'm not I'm on the side of the author so out of all the people that should be on the side I see where they're coming from and I was trying to give validity to my opinion because like I've spent the last 10 years, you know, living in Italy and I spent the last 15, you know, dedicated to learning Italian and learning about Italian food and wine. And I still agree with them. It's too much to the point that for me, I moved to Florence. I kind of bootstrapped my way throughout my life in Florence. I didn't come 
as like a trust fund kid. I didn't marry anybody, which, you know, no offense to anyone who has, but, you know, I've definitely had to start from scratch. Um, and so it's hard for me right now as uh, someone who has transplanted myself there to buy a house. It's hard to, to do certain things. It's hard to live a normal life because of how much attention has been given to the same places over and over again. And I don't care if that affects what, like 10 million people or 5 million people less come. I'm still going to have enough work. It is becoming too much. I can still work in, in my field and I can still benefit from that. And I can still criticize what's going on, that it's, it's become unsustainable. The sheer amount of people who are coming, you mean, to the same, yeah. the same five places, basically. Yeah, these shows also contribute to, and this is what I was trying to comment as well, is like to an unsustainable lifestyle for those of us who are local. Yes, like absolutely. it is unbearable sometimes. Like you, you can probably identify with Tiffany if you're in, you're in Rome, but Rome is bigger, you know, so some of it's spread out. You know, Florence is tiny, as you said, so you feel it a lot more. Yes, I also live in the outskirts of the city, so I don't have to deal with tourists on a daily basis. And I don't and I don't say that to be rude to tourists. I work with tourists, too. And yeah, uh, I am a tourist as much as I can be if I, you know, travel whenever I travel. So I'm not trying to diss tourists, but I don't. Yeah, I'm not living in the center of Rome anymore. It doesn't dif affect my daily life as much as someone living in the center of Florence, but it actually absolutely does affect life and it affects prices. And Romans cannot live in the center of Rome anymore. They just can't. They can't afford to. Can't afford to because of, you know, Airbnb everywhere. It's just become impossible to afford to live in the center of the city. And that's not, you know, we talked about this on an earlier episode called who is Rome for, you know, mm -hmm, uh, which we mm -hmm. did back during the COVID times. And, you know, it's, it does make you stop and think, you know, what is, is this city just for the tourists or is it also for, for the people who live here? And it needs to be a better balance. Besides somehow hoping that it somehow spreads around a little bit more, do you see any solutions? You know, try to ask yourself, are you going somewhere because it, it's super comfortable and because you know it or because you're really trying to embrace that adventure of, of travel, of going into something that's uncomfortable? Again, it's like this double-edged sword where I understand that people want to enjoy themselves. Like the same thing for me. Like I had a brutal year this year. I worked my, you know, my butt off and all I want to do is like, I'd love to just go to some beach or something and relax or, you know, you want that. So I, I appreciate that, that people have that have those needs after what we've been through uh, collectively. But uh, at the same time, it's like, if you really want to travel, put your money where your mouth is, go somewhere that you haven't gone to, you know, put yourself outside your comfort zone, go somewhere that you're not going to get a, sorry to again, bite the hand that feeds me, that's going to have a handy eater list to tell you where to eat, you know, actually travel. Yeah, it's true. Um, I think a lot of people don't have that concept when it comes to traveling. Vacation is vacation. You go on vacation to relax. And it's very easy to sort of say, well, you know, it's my vacation. I want to relax. I want to chill out. I want to go where places I love. And I can totally get that. But I also get your sort of take on it, which is to challenge people to go outside their comfort zone. You're not telling people that this is what they have to do, but it's a challenge. Right. It's a like, hey, if you if you say you love travel, maybe try going at least to a new country. Maybe go to Portugal instead of Italy. Well, and I think it's interesting too. I, I think it was in this article. I was just looking to see if I could find it, but I can't. But I think it's interesting too that these these television shows, like even if I, I've been to Italy a, a bunch of times, and and sometimes when I when I read about or watch some of these shows. It's almost like they're able to rewrite what my own experiences of it are. And the vivid example for me is that they'll often talk about like the amazing Italian beach. And I hate beaches in Italy. Like there is no, <laughs> there is nowhere I would rather go to a beach less than anywhere in Italy because I just find it, uh, uh, it's either overrun with beach umbrellas. There's nothing natural there It's co or it's covered in stones it's just mildly unpleasant. Too crowded. Every, yeah, everywhere you go. And, and then every article I read, it talks about the, the amazing vistas and beaches of Italy. And I'm like, okay, maybe the vistas, but the beaches, come on. You know, so some of this stuff is they're rewriting the truth. Your expectation can almost dictate what it is your experience of it is. 
Like if Tiffany shows up in Italy thinking of a room with a view in her head, which, you know, you might have if you listen to the show, there's a romanticism now built into whatever it is that happens to you. And so I can I can show up in an Italian beach and, and think, my gosh, this is total garbage. You know, there's crap everywhere. <laughs> and and right. still in my head be like, but the Italian beaches are really nice and think like, oh, this water is nice and warm or whatever it is. You know, you can... And maybe it goes back to your idea of marketing. It's almost like you can remarket the idea to me while I'm there. And if you go to a place where you have no real understanding or expectation of what it's going to be like, you can't overlay all those things onto it. If I may, I I think that Instagram has a big role to play in all of that. I feel like I am absolutely pray to the Instagram marketing of like, this is the perfect woman lifting her coffee cup uh, in front of Trevi Fountain and there's nobody there. And the, the little Italian boy jumping off the cliff, which was on my Instagram today. And like, it kept replaying this boy diving into the pure crystal Sardinian waters. And I think that this perfection that we see on Instagram is really I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have a, I don't know if I have a, a point to this sentence, but it's definitely detrimental totally agree. to the travel experience overall. I totally agree. I'd say dangerous. I'd go as far as say it's dangerous because, you know, now we have TikTok too that are creating like this, this craze. I, I've been blogging for since, you know, for like 12, 13 years now. So I've seen, you know, the ebbs and flows of it, but now it's like you have these mega influencers and people are obsessed with them. I've been working in tourism for over 10 years now, and I'm amazed to see like somebody will become a mega star on TikTok overnight. They develop a travel brand. They have no experience in tourism or travel and their tours will sell out overnight because people are just obsessed with that brand that they are selling about that place, which is completely curated. That is absolutely like nail on the head. Uh, that in social media needs to like slow its roll on like there's like fake news in it of itself you know through travel influencing yeah totally yeah I do I do appreciate the people who go on there now and they say Instagram versus reality and they show Uh, you know the girl sitting in front of this beautiful place and it's just paradise and her dress is flowing in the wind and then they show reality and there's all these other people waiting in line to take the picture I do appreciate that Well, we have to wrap it up soon. But Coral, since you're here, you do have kind of an interesting background. One thing we haven't mentioned is that you, um, you know, you're familiar with Seattle, too. I was thinking while you were talking about Instagram, how how much Seattle needs its own like tourist board or something. It probably has it. But, you know, whenever you ask anybody about are they going to come to Seattle, the only thing people ever say is, oh, no, it's just too rainy there. We have a terrible marketing problem out here. But you're from Seattle. And what's your background? So it's so funny that you say that. This is what I was alluding to before when I said that, you know, the U.S. could improve. I started out in food tourism in Seattle before I moved to Florence. So I worked in tourism in Seattle for a little bit, and I totally agree. There are amazing things to see and do, and it's a shame. It's just so behind compared to Italy, and I would never thought – these are the only situations in which I would say that Italy is more advanced. Uh, So uh, (laughs) in terms of – my background well i majored in italian i i'm not uh, i wasn't born and raised in seattle i moved around a lot growing up but i eventually landed in seattle so that's the place i lived the most growing up but i've i lived in the south i was born in southern california i moved to the south when i was young and grew up there and then i uh, moved to seattle when i was in high school i went on a trip to england and then to florence on a whim while i was still living in seattle i was actually doing i was a biology major I decided that from that trip that I had in Florence that I wanted to study Italian and move to Italy one day. I came back from my working holiday trip and I decided to enroll in Italian at the University of Washington. And I've always been obsessed with food from a small age. I'm half Iranian and also Italian American. So my mom's side of the family was like, you know, the typical like spaghetti and meatballs, Italian Americans, you know, that immigrated like, you know, a long time ago from Sicily. And then my dad's side of the family is from Iran. So I grew up between Persian food and Italian American food. And I've just always been obsessed with food and learning more about it. So I minored in geography where most of my coursework was done in like food studies and food anthropology and all of that. Once I completed my Italian degree, I worked for a bit and then I just made the plunge to Florence in 2012. And I guess the rest is history, but I started my food blog 
when I had just graduated from university because I had a lot of thoughts on my study abroad experiences in Italy and Italian food and food culture in Seattle. And then when I moved to Florence, I, I kept on blogging. And then eventually my tours parlayed from my food blogs. That's where I am now. I hope that's not a too long of an answer to your question. No, not at all. Not no. at all. For you, with your interest and obsession with food from an early age, was it about heritage or was it about physicality, physical flavors? Like, What was it about it that was so intriguing? Yeah, so it's funny because my first trip was to Florence. When I was there, I fell in love with the art and the sunshine. I was staying in this hostel that was in the outskirts of Florence, and it was an ancient hospital that was then converted to a hostel. And I just remember picking a peach or having peaches that were picked from that the tree that morning and eating them and remembering how distinct and how flavorful that was. It was very stereotypical of how I fell in love with Italy. I called my mom from a payphone. I was like, we have Italian heritage, right? We can get citizenship because I want to be here. It wasn't like I've always been obsessed with my Italian roots. I've probably been more obsessed with my Iranian roots. And I've traveled to Iran. Part of the reason why I'm like people should get out of their comfort zone a little bit when they travel because it was the best travel experience of my life. But I fell in love with Italy just because of all the things that people love about. And that's the irony of why I, I'm still critical. <laughs> Oh my, I get it. I totally get why people love Italy. It was me that had that same reaction. Well, I think we have to leave it there, even though I feel like we opened more doors than we actually closed them. But I think that's kind of the goal of the show. And I think it was the goal of the article. And certainly, Coral, your take on things. I love the different angles that you think about this in. Is there anywhere you want to send people? We're going to put links to your stuff in the show Thank notes. You. But is there anywhere in particular you want people to go? Ooh, where I want people to go visit. I think Calabria would be a good start. Mm -hmm. uh, I think going to southern Italy, going to the very south and going to the very north. And then, I mean, everywhere. Um, <laughs> the Marche doesn't get attention. Abruzzo doesn't get attention. Well, Umbria kind of is getting a bit of attention. But I'd say like Abruzzo, Le Marche. Kind of Molise, under, under come on, Molise, well, where my ancestors are from. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm so nobody sorry. Nobody yes, goes to Molise. Molise. Like, so right. nobody. <laughs> you will be the only cool. tourist there. One thing I will add for those people listening who are into cocktails, Tinar is an artichoke-based liqueur that's like kind of old school, and it's used in spritz, and especially in Venice, but you see it in cocktails, but it's from Molise. Oh. I, didn't, I learned this recently. Hmm. So anyone who's that's like a cocktail geek, and knows what Chinar is, it's from Molise. So that's the reason enough to go to Molise. Well, there if, you go. And if you want to send people to Iran, where should we go in Iran? Oh, man. Um, my favorite city was Esfahan. I loved Esfahan. It's really beautiful. It has all these bridges, and it's, it's really um, gorgeous and really well maintained. Shiraz is uh, the capital of poetry for Iran. I love Shiraz. I like Kashan because it's areas where rose water is produced. There's a lot of rose and Persian cuisine. When things get better there, we should definitely talk about Iran travel, where to go. Okay, that's a deal. We'll keep an eye on it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. You're yeah, very welcome. Yeah, and if you're interested in taking a food tour or wine tour in Tuscany, Coral is going to hook you up. So get in touch with her. Where can they find you? So I'm Curious Appetite on Instagram, and then my website is CuriousAppetiteTravel.com. Okay. And I promise so he... <laughs> I am not salty about Italy. I do love it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you won't spend the whole tour being like, I don't know why you guys came here, but <laughs> now that you're here, I'll show you some stuff. All right. Well, thank you so much. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. I'm Tiffany Barks. Join us again. Bye. If you love the show, take a moment to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love to read while you listen, and your rating might help someone else discover the show. Take just a couple of minutes to let the world know what you think of this show. It means the world to us. Thanks. Thanks.